This is the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast, Episode 702 Research Based Strategies for Distance Learning Now with Dr. Matthew Rhodes. Welcome to the 10 Minute Teacher Podcast, hosted by author, educator, speaker, and mom, the Cool Cat Teacher, Vicki Davis. If you're teaching at a distance, and many of us are, you'll want to listen to what Vicky's guest, Dr. Matthew Rhodes, has to offer. Matthew is coaching teachers to improve teacher-student engagement with very specific strategies. In addition to being an educational specialist and public lecturer, he's the author of Navigating the Toggle Term, Preparing Secondary Educators for Navigating Fall 2020 and Beyond. If hybrid learning, online instructional infrastructure, EdTech tools, and online frameworks that can help you toggle between online, hybrid, and traditional educational settings is of interest to you. Keep listening. In this podcast, Dr. Rhodes reflects authentically on these things, along with the challenges we're facing now. Well, let's jump in. Enjoy! This week on my blog, I shared the benefits of using chalk and plan board and how my school uses them to plan our curriculum and our lessons. Stay tuned at the end of the show to learn how you can start planning and plan board for free. Today, we're talking with Dr. Matthew Rhodes, author of the book, Navigating the Toggle Term, Preparing Secondary Educators for Navigating Fall 2020 and Beyond. So Matt, as we talk about technology this fall, you know, a lot of teachers have worked through the challenges of learning the tech and they feel pretty good at it. Um, What's next and how do we align it with the research about learning? Thanks for having me. I think we need to really integrate these instructional strategies that can work not only in blended learning or more traditional settings, but also in online settings, because really I think within an entire school year, we're going to be in multiple settings. And I think having a set and toolbox of these instructional strategies that can work in these settings will go a long ways because I think that there's going to be a lot of challenges as we transition. And I think that if we have a few things in our toolbox, it'll be a smoother ride for all of us. Yes. Having a teacher toolbox is a great best practice to say, okay, these are my tools that I'm going to lean on. And it doesn't have to be the same for all the teachers. I mean, besides your content management system or learning management system, I guess, right? Of course. Okay. So where do we start? How are you working with teachers to help them? Like, what are you doing right now with this? So currently I am a secondary educator myself in special education, but also I teach teacher candidates at a university in San Diego, as well as I supervise teacher candidates. So really, my goal is in terms of my professional development is to show the teachers the tech of what I do on a daily basis by putting them in a position as a student, but also putting them into position as a teacher building the content, as well as providing them opportunities to incorporate instructional strategies into what they're creating. So that's kind of what I do on a daily basis. And currently what I'm doing now, for example, one of my most recent collaboration strategies, just simply just using a Google Jamboard, collaborating on a Google Jamboard, and for example, students providing links to math concepts we're learning, for example, today, multi-step equations, and they provided us with basically links to various types of problems or real-world applications to solving for X or solving for a variable. And I've done the same thing for teacher candidates where they have incorporate their own screencast of their lesson so other teachers can view it as well as their lesson plan. So these are just one example of just integrating, you know, a tool, but also the ability to mass brainstorm and share, which is also a, an instructional strategy. So how do you demonstrate this for teachers? Do they come in and observe your classroom? They observe my classroom by I provide them screencasts of the online learning taking place, but also I provide engaging online presentations that, you know, one is basically shows them how to do it, but then it provides them the opportunity to do it themselves and then to share it out with the rest of the training. Now you're 100% online right now, aren't you? We are 100% all online in California, for the most part, outside of just some rural areas. And uh, I'm face to face, but have had a, a little bit of, uh, I guess, hybrid high flex as we've had a few situations for that. 
But it's different, isn't it? I mean, some people talk about Zoom fatigue. The kids get tired. And, you know, if if we just have teachers lecturing in Zoom, that's not good, is it? No, not at all. I think that we really need to do away with a lot of the Zoom that we're doing. I suggest maybe two times per week. And if you're going to do a Zoom, do it in 15-minute increments, max, and then allow students to have that asynchronous time for learning to practice a task or to create something. Really, that's my best practice for the Zoom fatigue. I mean, I think that if you're expecting teachers to be on Zoom for an entirety of a 90-minute period or even longer, that's not good for teachers, but also the kids. Yeah, but you know, the struggle is there are a lot of parents who are not at home. And the kids are somewhat unsupervised. And so the one thing is, you know, even if that kid is jumping up and down or whatever, if they're on camera and a teacher's there, it's more supervision than running around the house doing a Macaulay Coughlin uh, home alone thing. <laughs> yeah, of course. So no, I, I, I totally understand that. And that's definitely a challenge that we're working with, with uh, the whole distance learning instructional model that we're working with. I think that we have to, as educators, create engaging spurts of time that we have with the students. And then, you know, if, for example, you have to stay in a Zoom session for, you know, an hour to hour and a half, then create some breakout rooms for students who are working with one or two students and then go in and pop in, coach, mentor while they're doing the asynchronous work versus having them all together in one major Zoom room. Oh, so you'd put each child in their own breakout room? Yes, that is one of the strategies that I like to do. For example, if they're working asynchronously on a sort of an assignment, then I can come in, I ask them to share their screen, show me where they're at get out the whiteboard, do a collaborative problem with them, see how they're doing, test for understanding, and then move on to the next student. It feels overwhelming, doesn't it? I mean, what do you do? Do you have any kids just totally not engaging? And how are you handling that? Yeah, of course, I'm dealing with some massive attendance issues. And honestly, I mean, the best thing that I feel like I can do is post all my content on Monday and have it due on Sunday and just have it always available for my students because, you know, there's equity issues. And, you know, I know that they may not be able to attend when we're designated to have class, but they can attend when they have time and from really anywhere. So that's kind of my goal is to create a platform where they have the ability to go in and do it independently if they have to. Yeah, we're posting all of our lesson plans. We use chalk and post all of them. I mean, every day so that if somebody is at home, they have all the detail that they need. But you know, I've, I've heard some people talk about, quote, the lost generation. You know, there are kids out there, we know, that basically haven't been in school since March 13th. Yeah, no, I definitely do agree that we're going to have, I think, this last year, and then we're going to go onwards probably for another 12 to 18 months with this. And we're going to have some definitely that learning loss. But I think that there's hopefully over time as more protocols are put in place and we open more in person for students of high need, then I think that hopefully we can service those students that need it the most first. And then really, hopefully over time, when we can get the virus under control locally, we can be more in person. I think the in-person is going to be key, but we all have to follow the rules to get to that point. That is true, but it can be done. It's just not easy and it's challenging. And of course, the, the fear, I mean, the fear that we get from the news media can make it very hard to, to do our job. And I'm speaking from someone at a face-to-face -face school. I mean, now it's just normal and we want to be there. But I'll tell you, starting up was hard. No, I, I can only imagine. I, you know, we're probably not going to go back, at least at the secondary level in our county, I'm guessing December, or probably January at the earliest. And, you know, it's scary. But I think, like you said, is that hopefully, you know, it's going to be tough to get in and start the first three to four weeks. But hopefully, if the protocols are followed and people aren't going to get sick, then, you know, there'll be less fear as we start moving forward. So, but Matt, we're definitely going to have the haves and the have nots. You've got some kids who've been moving forward in their education. And then we've got some kids that have been stagnating. And we know that there's no such thing as stagnating. They're moving backwards. And, you know, we're talking about research-based best practices. That is your focus. What do we do? Like, how do you handle this full gamut? These kids that are like, you got to give me more. I'm ready to move ahead. I don't want to be left behind. And then you've got these kids that it's like, are you there? Do you exist? 
Yeah, I mean, that's the all-encompassing problem that we're facing right now. And I think that if we're focusing on instruction on a day-to-day basis, we provide universal design for learning strategies. Our districts invest in services like paper learning, which is a 24-7 on-demand tutoring service. Also, you know, provide students with the hardware and internet connection that they need. I mean, those are just things that we can do now. And then I think that when we can get to the point where it's safe for some in-person learning, put in the people, the students that need the services the most. And I think that's really what we can do. We can't look at it the long game right now. We got to be focused on, you know, the present in the next few weeks because everything is so fluid and changing at this point. So as we finish up, Matt, you're staying upbeat, you're working hard, you're pushing through and you're caring about learning. What's your encouragement to educators out there? Because there are a lot like you that are in distance and they're just like, I I need a teacher to give me some encouragement and hope. Yeah, of course. And I think that we all have to think less is more in this situation and try not to overdo it with the tools. Don't overdo it with the instructional strategies. Have your go-to three to five tools. Have your go-to five to seven instructional strategies that you are comfortable using and Try to just balance your life out the best that you can and provide yourself with that balance and self-care too. And saying all that, that hopefully will provide some encouragement as I think that this is a manageable crisis that we can get through. But at the same time, we have to be really strategic about it and try not to overwhelm ourselves. We do. I know that you said that before we were talking, um, as we started, the fires are out in your county, but you've got people who are dealing with wildfires. You've got people in my area dealing with the aftermath of hurricanes. It's, It's not just a pandemic. There's a lot going on. And we also have to remember that kids need to look at us as as reference adults to say, okay, how are they handling this? And can I handle this? Because this is just such a challenging time. So the book is Navigating the Toggled Term, Preparing Secondary Educators for Navigating Fall 2020 and Beyond with Dr. Matthew Rhodes. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate having me. As we prepare to teach in a blended or distance learning environment, a rock solid lesson planner is a must. I use a free program called Plan Board for my lesson planning. My school uses Plan Board with Chalk.com's curriculum planning tool. This powerful tool links with standards and gives us the ability to do some time saving, efficient reporting, and tracking. The best thing about Plan Board is I can plan my lessons anywhere on my Mac, my PC, my iPad, or even my phone. Wherever I work, my lesson plans are with me. And as I said, Plan Board is free for teachers. Check out Plan Board now and sign up for free at coolcatteacher.com forward slash Plan Board. That's coolcatteacher.com forward slash P L A N B O A R D. And join me and thousands of educators everywhere for this amazing lesson planning tool. Thanks.